Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. This is a special edition of the podcast uh, related to Ukraine and Russia and Putin. I have on a returning guest, John Mueller, who I contacted uh, on Friday, and we recorded this on Saturday, uh, March uh, 5th. John is the author of The Stupidity of War, American Foreign Policy in the Case for Complacency, by which he means negotiations and other means of avoiding war and armed conflict. Uh, and so here we are. And of course, like pretty much the rest of the world, he thinks the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a stupid war, and it is. However, he also shows both in this conversation, and please do also see the op-ed he wrote that we're publishing in eSkeptic along with this podcast, uh, in which he outlines how this could have been avoided, although what's the point at this point since we're are where we are, uh, but that, in fact, uh, negotiating with Putin was an option. That is, Putin made it clear he didn't want Ukraine to join NATO. Well, we never hear the other side of that story, which John Mueller does give us, that you can't just join NATO. You have to apply, and it takes years. And if your country is corrupt and broke, you're not likely to uh, become a member of NATO anyway. So it would have been easy to say, well, we can't assure that Ukraine will never join NATO, uh, but we can delay it, let's say, 20 years or 25 years, and by which time Putin will be in his 90s, and that'll be the end of the game anyway for that problem. So why didn't we do that? Okay, well, we talk about that. And if there's anyone watching this that can get uh, John to the connected to the State Department more than his contacts, he has some, uh, but uh, that would be good. Pass along this podcast, pass along his op-ed um, the, the, the Ukraine and NATO is just one of, of four issues that uh, Putin had that we discuss. The others are, are pretty marginal and probably not likely to happen in terms of our compromising with the State Department. But that's the bottom line. And, uh, and then from there, we also talk about kind of the history of Russia, USSR, the uh, Cold War. Are we in Cold War II? He thinks no, uh, although some people have said that. The issues with oil and natural gas... Uh, the Baltic states and NATO, the no-fly zone, the breakaway independent groups in Ukraine, and and uh, and what that means for the future of Ukraine, uh, the Crimea, and what their economic status is, which is not good. Russia. We also talk about the uh, economics of all this because Russia is also a, a relatively, I wouldn't say poor country, but they are no means, uh, by no means, at the the top of the economic powerhouses. So what are they doing? Would they be doing this kind of thing if they didn't have nukes? Uh, Well, he thinks probably not, and I agree. Anyway, this was a great conversation. Please pass this along. It's important for what we're going through right now. Thanks for listening. And if you appreciate uh, our work, please go to skeptic.com slash donate and give us some support there. Skeptic Society is a 501c3 nonprofit, so your donations are tax deductible. Okay, thanks for listening. Before I introduce today's guest in our episode, uh, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, this is Wondrium, the former teaching company, the great courses, you know them. Uh, Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com is the place to go for great online content, not just the great courses from the teaching company in the past, which, by the way, you used to have to rent, and they would mail you these big boxes. They were like this long of cassette tapes that I would listen to on my bike rides on a Sony Walkman. That's how far back we go. Well, these guys obviously caught up and digitized and streaming content online, so you can just listen to it while you're driving or hiking, walking, doing chores, whatever you're doing. And uh, and if you and if you so it's a subscription service that gives you access to all the courses. You can bounce around from lecture to lecture, which is usually what I do. Some lectures I find more interesting than others, so I'll just stop one and start another one, or even change courses in midstream just because it's fun. And uh, you can do that by going to wondrium.com slash Shermer and get a 22-day free trial, at the end of which you can either uh, not subscribe, although I don't know why you wouldn't, or just subscribe. It's cheap. It's well worth it. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer. Like, here's an example. One that I'm going to listen to with obvious relevance, an introduction to infectious diseases. Lectures, 24 lectures, 30 minutes each. Like, here's a few samplers. Uh, bacteria, your heroes and villains, milestones in infectious disease history, been a lot of those, 
uh, antibiotics, a modern miracle lost. Well, they're talking about the human body acclimatizing to these um, antibodies. That still may happen. Uh, zoonosis, germs leak from animals to humans. Gee, where have we heard that? Maybe. This is how COVID-19. Still, don't discount the lab leak, accidental lab leak hypothesis. That's still on the table. Ooh, flesh-eating bacteria. Uh, the nemesis of mankind, HIV and AIDS. Remember uh, how deadly HIV was? 100% fatal initially compared to COVID, which is uh, well less than 1%. So we got lucky with this one. It could have been much worse. And then finally, outbreak, contagion, the next pandemic. Um, well, we're in the next pandemic, but you know this won't be the last for sure. So this is the kind of content you can soak up while you're just doing something else. It's great. So again, go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, get your 22-day free trial and give it a shot. All right. Thanks for listening. I am very pleased to tell you about our new sponsor for this episode. It's The Lost Debate. It's a podcast and a YouTube show in which three different guests or hosts banter the latest events in culture, politics, economics, ideology, and society in general uh, through debate, discussion, um, disputation, and all the good stuff across the political spectrum. No political bubbles in this show. The three hosts are Ravi Gupta, a former staffer for President Obama, and a school principal who founded ARENA, an organization that has trained thousands of campaign staffers and helped elect hundreds of candidates. Corey Bradford, a political organizer from the Deep South, turned TikTok star. Yeah, that's cool. And he once hosted a Fox News radio show. And Ricky Schlott, a Gen Z New York Post columnist and libertarian fighting to protect free speech. I binge watched a bunch of them and they were super interesting. Uh, the ones I listened to were on educational reform. Ravi was a former principal at a school. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that led me to invite him on my show. And this was one of the most interesting conversations I've ever had about politics because he's not pigeonholed into a particular uh, political bubble. In fact, all three of them are interested in figuring out what's true about any particular subject that they're discussing, and so you get a nice broad range. You all know how I feel about uh, this whole subject, that they want to be pigeonholed as just the person who only reads the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or only listens to Fox News or CNN. You have to have a broad spectrum of lots of different sources, and that's what the lost debate does. Anyway, so give it a shot. Check out uh, The Lost Debate on your uh, preferred podcast platform and give them, a, give them a listen or a binge listen as I did. It was really fun. So The Lost Debate, check it out. They are our new sponsor and I'm proud to have them. Thanks for listening and here's our show. Last time you were on, we discussed your book, The Stupidity of War. And if ever there seemed like a stupid war, it uh, is the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine so uh, let's just start right off. Uh, we're recording this on March 5th. How could this have been avoided? Well, it seems to me that there are uh, miscellaneous possibilities, uh, two in particular. Uh, uh, Putin, if you read what he says, um, and uh, his actual declamations are that he's basically been dissed uh, in, uh, in, before, and he's very concerned about uh, the expansion of NATO. That is not just Putin. Uh, the Russians have been saying that including liberal Western-oriented ones since the 1990s, uh, the idea of having NATO creep into uh, the former Soviet Republic of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, also, he's been, he's been trying to get the attention of uh, Biden and has sent a couple of messages earlier this year, uh, or last year, uh, and said, uh, let's talk about Ukraine and so forth. And they didn't, they didn't even respond to him, apparently, as far as I know. Um, that's certainly what they say. Um, uh, what he's got is, uh, if you look just at what he demands, uh, it's uh, basically no-brainers. Uh, the uh, idea, what, what he, he came out with specific demands, of course, in December, uh, in which he said he wanted NATO not to agree not to uh, admit uh, Ukraine for the rest of eternity. 
Um, now, effectively, uh, you don't have to go to eternity. You can go to 10, 20 or 25 years because it'll take 10 or 20 or 20 or 25 years for Ukraine to be eligible potentially for uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, membership. Uh, there's several uh, countries such as France and Germany, I understand, that don't want it in under pretty much any circumstances. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not really eligible because it has border conflicts uh, with many countries, including Moldova, and also because um, it's a basket case economically. Uh, is riddled with unbelievable corruption from top to bottom. Every president that has been in has basically stolen billions of dollars, uh, and it hasn't grown economically. It's, in fact, of all the 25 ex-communist countries, it's the one that's done worst uh, in terms of economic development. Uh, wow. In 1991, when it started, it had about the same GDP per capita as Poland, and now it has about one quarter or one third uh, uh, the, the uh, GDP of, of Poland. So basically, there's no reason for it to get in. So if it basically say, well, let's, let's not talk about, let's talk about forever. How about 20 or 25 years after which Putin, of course, will be, um, will be uh, 95 years old and we can, maybe things will change by then. Um, so that's one possibility. It seems like it's basically just formalizing reality. <laughs> so if we try to understand the causes of war at, from the perspective of the um, aggressor, what you're saying is that from Putin's perspective, Ukraine has always been a kind of a buffer zone for NATO as a threat. And so he would like to have that buffer zone by not having Ukraine become part of NATO. He reached out to the West and the West didn't even respond. That's right. not even on the table. Right. They didn't even come back and say, well, we can't do, can't keep them out of uh, NATO forever, but about 20, 25 years which would be codifying reality, essentially. They're not going to be in for that time. There's another possibility, which would be to uh, do something like what was done with Austria in the mid-1950s, which is basically neutralize it with full agreement on all sides, and it could live basically peacefully in that way. Putin did say in a talk, or rather in an article he wrote last summer, uh, that uh, what he was looking for was something like that. He said, we, we want to do something that's like Austria versus Germany. Uh, two countries, basically same traditions, background, language, etc., whatever, religion. Uh, and they flow freely back and forth across the border. One is a big country, one is a small country. Um, and there's no really no problem. So he's actually brought that up as a possibility. Um, so, so essentially, uh, what could happen potentially, at least according to what he says, um, is that uh, we could work out a neutralization for, neutralization for uh, Putin, for, for Ukraine. Uh, either uh, or else just uh, have a have a uh, moratorium on admitting it in. Uh, basically, really easy things to do overall. Obviously, a lot of deals, details to work out, um, but um, uh, it, it hasn't been really accessed. It, it hasn't really been discussed, as far as I can see. Yeah, what does it take to join NATO? I I don't I don't know anything about that. How does that work? Well, you have to apply, and uh, then they have to let you in. It's like a fraternity. Um, and um, if they don't like you, they don't let you in. And they do have rules. And one of the rules is you can't have a lot of border conflicts. And uh, Ukraine has plenty, including not only with Russia, but also with uh, Moldova. Um, so in many respects, it is not eligible. Uh, it's also been an economic and political basket case. Um, as I, as I, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, the, the, the post-communist country has done worst in terms of economic development since 1991. Right. So if, if Russia wasn't even on the table and NATO and, and Ukraine went to NATO and said, we want to join, they'd likely say no, uh, because you can't pay your share of that. You're supposed to allocate what 2% of your GDP toward NATO defense. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of rules. Um, and one of them is this one I mentioned about the borders. Uh, it's also, uh, riddled with corruption. Every president, at least until Zelensky, uh, has basically looted the country, stolen billions of dollars. Uh, the politics and the judiciary are unbelievably corrupt. So before I could even think of accepting it, they'd have to clean that up, and that's really hard. Zelensky started to do something along that line when he came in a few years ago uh, and then abandoned the process. Um, the, you know, the head of the anti-corruption uh, thing is apparently about as corrupt as you can get himself. Um, and uh, so Russia is even more corrupt, I have to admit. 
Um, but nonetheless, it's just uh, yeah. it's just that won't fit in NATO. But that's all you hear about in Western media is how corrupt Putin's regime is with all his billionaire oligarchs and their yachts and private jets and so on. How come you don't hear about any of the Ukrainian oligarchs? Where are, where are they? And where is that money? Uh, well, they uh, in the same places um, uh, that uh, the other oligarchs are doing. Uh, it, it, one example is that if you're a politician, like in the, in the uh, parliament, uh, you're free from um, prosecution. So what every politician does is they get in and then they borrow tons of money from banks and never pay it back. Uh, meanwhile, the bank directors are also stealing the money. A dozen scores, maybe hundreds of banks have gone bankrupt uh, within Ukraine over the last years. It's a, it's a nightmare. The people know it. And they keep voting people in who they think will clean it up. And then they turn out to be a bigger crook than the guy before him, pretty much. As I say, Zelensky, as far as I know, at least, it does not fit in that mold. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, the point is, you, having a mind-bogglingly corrupt country within NATO is simply not acceptable to uh, countries uh, that, uh, such as France and, and, uh, and Germany and probably everybody. So in order to clean that right. up, it would take, uh, take 20 or 30 years. Uh, assuming they really start now and do it well. Uh, so consequently, putting off membership for 20 or 30 years is a no-brainer. Uh, it's, no, it's, it's simply formalizing so, what's going to happen anyway. How come our State Department hasn't done that? And do you think Trump would have done that? Uh, I, respond, I mean, respond to Putin by saying, we'll work something out and it, rather than just ignore him. Like well, uh, predicting Trump is harder than predicting Putin. Uh, you know, God knows what he would do, and he's not very <laughs> trustworthy overall. Um, I think they don't want to give in, and they were worried about being called appeasers. Um, and this would be appeasing him. Mm. You've got this guy, he's got this problem. It's a limited problem, as far as I can see. He doesn't want to, uh, he doesn't want to take over Ukraine or bring it back and reformulate the Soviet Union. Though sometimes people think, speculate about that and think in the opposite direction. Uh, and so it seems to me that uh, we should, uh, and, and so if they're giving in to him, even if it's giving in in a very simple, straightforward manner, reasonable manner to assuage uh, his concerns, uh, he, they, they don't want to do it. And as I, as I stressed, it's not just Putin. And, you know, I have a student there, uh, a former student who's been working in Russia, and I've been corresponding a bit with him in the last few months. Uh, and he says the attitude there is, we love Ukraine, Ukrainians. They're our brothers, but we don't want them in NATO. We see it as a security threat. That's just a common thing. And again, it's coming from Western-oriented uh, uh, intellectuals as well as Putin types. So he's speaking for the masses and, and widespread. I think that's totally nonsense. <laughs> In other words, delusionary. I don't think NATO has any interest in starting a war against Russia or anything like that. And they keep, they keep saying we're, it's a peaceful defensive alliance. I think they mean it, and I think it's true. Uh, but the problem is if you insult somebody or they get this idea that you're out to get them, the problem is in their mind, not in your mind. If you insult somebody by saying they're fat, um, then, uh, you know, they, uh, even if you're trying to say you ought to get you into shape, um, uh, the person may be offended, and the offense lies in the eye of the offender, of the offended, not in the uh, in, in the other anything else. Right. So, I wonder if this our our response goes back to the 2014 annexation of Crimea, where um, Obama said, you know, that was really bad, and then didn't do anything, and so that seemed like an appeasement. Like, well, okay, uh, we're not going to do anything. And so I guess maybe the attitude now is, well, we better do something because that just encourages him even more. So we're just going to draw a line in the sand. And this time we're going to stick to that line. You yeah. Know, it's, you it's, can't it, have whatever you're demanding. That's it. It probably is something that Obama at the time did say uh, there's people in this town who want to, to send troops to stop the takeover of Crimea and so forth. Raise your hand. And there were very few. There were no hands raised, of course, as you pointed out. Uh, so there's something about that. But. The issue is this guy believes that, uh, and, and the Russian people generally and intellectuals, liberal ones as well as, you know, the, the right wing, um, uh, see the encroachment into Ukraine as a threat. It's not intended to be a threat. And one thing you can do is say, well, oh, okay, you got this problem. How about if we put off any even really thinking about it for 25 years or so? How about that? 
Or how about if we work out a formal agreement like we did very, very successfully with Austria in the 1950s, uh, which will formally make it neutral? Um, and obviously, if you attack it or somebody attacks it, you know, we can change our minds and so forth. It, it'll be like Austria and sort of putter along the way it wants to. It can be as capitalistic or, or, or uncapitalistic or democratic or undemocratic as it wants to be. Uh, and, but it won't be a threat to you. And then as far as I can see, they're not really making that argument because it would seem to be giving in to his demands. Right. So we're sort of drawing a line in the sand and saying, no, we're, we're not going to concede to your demands. And then he, it, like a chess player, says, OK, I'm going to move my troops in. And then we say, well, that's really bad. But now Zelensky yesterday asked for NATO to enforce a no-fly zone. Well, I don't think that's going to happen, right? Because if NATO or U.S. planes shoot down a Russian plane over Ukraine, then that's NATO. That's NATO involved in the conflict. And now we have a Russian-NATO conflict, right? Then what would happen? Right. It'd be really bad. Uh, potentially, it could really escalate. Uh, and of course, Biden has been very clear from the very beginning that he's not going to send troops, and he's doing that in other countries as well. No one wants to die for Ukraine, which isn't even a member of, of, of NATO. Though there is this incredible sympathy for it, of course. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's not surprising, but it's, in quantity, it's, 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 it's pretty impressive throughout the whole world of seeing it as a victim of, of the invasion. Now, the question is, what I've been talking about before was, doing this before he invaded, which, and, I, and I thought basically that's what he was trying to do, is get some sort of deal along that line and was not getting any real response. And then he, then, he, then he decided to invade, which I think is really stupid on his part. Um, and I was, I was quite surprised because I didn't think he was that dumb. Um, but now the question is, can you resurrect that? And potentially um, you could. Um, there are the, the Ukrainians are now meeting with the Russians in the uh, uh, border area of, of uh, Belarus. Uh, they, they just the last few days, they have come up with one agreement already, uh, which is not a big deal, but and it obviously suits both sides, which is to allow uh, corridors for people to get out of the get out of the firing area. Um, and a possibility is that the Ukrainians would be able to say, "Okay, look, we will stay out of NATO." Uh, it, at least for a, a long period of time, and uh, uh, and or will we'll try to work. They'd have to agree to any kind of a neutralization agreement as well. Maybe something will come out of that. Uh, Putin just recently, four days ago, five days ago, said he had, he had talking to Macron, of uh, Fran President of France, uh, apparently had four demands. Uh, one was neutralization of, of uh, Ukraine. Second was demilitarization of Ukraine. Third, third was uh, Nazification of Ukraine. And fourth was recognition of his acquisition of Crimea. Uh, all those are negotiable, obviously, and the last one is very tricky in a lot of ways. Um, though a possibility would be to have a, uh, a lot of the people who have proposed this Austrian solution see it as potentially a real settlement for the whole of Central Europe. And uh, the, the Soviet, the Russians have not in, uh, recognized Kosovo. And one possibility is they recognize Kosovo and we recognize Crimea or something like that. Um, so that's a, that's a possibility as well. Um, it could uh, basically uh, you, you, really solve the problem overall if in, in, with enough negotiation, potentially. That, that, seems, that seems like a no-brainer. But So you called his invasion stupid, but if you were Putin, again, we're taking Putin's perspective just to try to understand what he's up to. Um, so you make your demands, uh, you know, NATO can't, uh, Ukraine can't become part of NATO. And then maybe we come back and go, okay, how about for 25 years? And okay. And, but we don't do that. We're just silent. So what would he, what should he have done to get that demand met, which seems kind of logical besides invade? Well, he had to, he was calling attention to the problem. Um, but conceivably, he could, he, could, he could say, okay, not forever, but for 25 years, how's that? Uh, but it really should be the Americans, who are, are in the West, generally, which is bringing up these proposals uh, and developing them. They have, they have been talked about in the outside. There's a couple of articles, one by uh, Anatole Levin at uh, Quincy Institute, and one by Steve Van Ever of MIT at uh, Defense Priorities, which have gone into this in quite a bit of detail, the, the, the Austrian idea. So the idea is there. 
I think his problem with with the invasion, which I, as I said, I didn't think he'd go that far, um, and he may, maybe just got ticked off. Uh, but uh, uh, I, the, the reason I didn't think he'd be that stupid was that even if the invasion had been a walkover, which I think they probably expected, they would still have to occupy this huge country filled with resentful people. And the thing that bothers me a lot is that he's sort of gotten irrational um, in the last few, mm. week, few weeks. I'm talking about you know, there's Nazis everywhere and everybody in charge there is a terrorist mm. or a Nazi or a, um, um, uh, a neo-Nazi or, or uh, something else, uh, uh, and, uh, or a drug addict. Um, and, uh, what does he mean by that? that? There's no Nazis there. He must mean far-right extremists yeah. of, of different kinds? Yeah, there are neo-Nazis, and they, they took part in the attacks on, uh, in the defense and in, in the Crimea thing. Um, and in fact, uh, in the in the nineteen uh, uh, twenty thirteen twenty fourteen, uh, uh, they were fairly prominent, and they're doing some shooting, uh, and they were they they scared a lot of Russians, and they were used, of course, by the Russians uh, to say it, to the, to ethnic Russians in Crimea, uh, you you know if you if you stick around, you're going to get be killed by a Nazi. Um, so they, they do exist. They're not, they, they're not dominating the thing. They're running the thing. And they can, denazification would probably be, uh, could be handled. Um, they, it, that's not the real issue. But, and also, but, Kato, but, but uh, Putin's sort of irrationality on this issue, uh, I think, is a little bit on the scary side. Mm, so you would not consider him to be a savvy chess player at this point. Uh, he's probably acting a little more irrationally uh, than you would have predicted when you talk about uh the recognition of crimea i mean he has it so do you mean where the western nations say yes okay we acknowledge that that's yours now and he doesn't need as much military hardware to protect it or i do seem to recall there was some canal taking fresh water to the crimea peninsula that the ukrainians cut off i think they even bombed it so they can't get as much fresh water there so that's a problem yeah, the Crimean acquisition is, you know, was fairly popular within Russia. It had, it had previously been part of Russia, of course, before Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine in the 50s. And, and uh, basically not doing it even legally at that time by Soviet, by Soviet law. Um, but uh, Crimea is a very poor place. Uh, in fact, some has pointed out that it's now the, uh, it's as poor as the poorest sections of all of Russia. Um, and also Donbass is even worse. So in many respects, Ukraine is better off without both of us too. Uh, but essentially, uh, just to be hard-nosed realist on this, uh, Crimea is going back to Ukraine about the same time that Texas goes back to Mexico. I mean, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, and what, what you'd have to do is, uh, I mean, the, the, the Russians have not recognized the succession of Kosovo from Serbia. And the United States could do that as well. Mm. Not, they, of course, they have not recognized that. Uh, that'd be a negotiable sort of thing, but um, uh, that would be that's tricky stuff. Uh, but the, the key thing would be basically neutralization of Ukraine, uh, and uh, not so much demilitarizing it, but obviously reducing its, its military, and certainly not putting in nuclear weapons or anything like that, or NATO weapons in that, in that country. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the foolishness on the part of of of. of, of uh, 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 Putin and going in, it seems like it was just sort of a temper tantrum, tantrum sort of thing. Uh, and now he's got to do something, you know, it's a nightmare uh, from his standpoint. And also, the sanctions uh, have seemed to be re remarkably effective, and they're really consensual uh, uh, throughout the world, pretty much. Uh, and uh, so, long term for Russia, this looks really, really bad. Um, no one's going to trust them. Uh, the, the West Europeans, who are its, its big part, his big uh, customers for natural gas, just is not a matter of sanctions, but it's a matter of playing good public policy, it's saying we can't rely on Russia to supply us with natural gas. He's he's too unreliable. We can't, you know, we need it. <laughs> We're going to freeze to death. We don't have it in the, in the winter. Uh, and I think that's that's just a natural thing. So that's going to happen no matter what happens. Um, and uh, people will be moving to alternate energy sources, liquid natural gas from perhaps the United States, uh, also nuclear potentially, um, which the way that Germany got into this bind, they got rid of their nuclear. 
uh, and so consequently had to get yeah. something from elsewhere, and they became uh, supplicants in some sense to the Russians. Is it your sense that the Russian people are not behind this invasion, that it really is one man and his his puppet, his his insider uh, mil- military leaders or whoever, it can't just be him, but... But but the majority of Russians don't want it. And then what what's your sense about the rank and file soldiers? We're hearing some of these stories about, you know, the Russian soldiers in the invasion in Ukraine don't know why they're there, and they're, you know, they're struggling to find some motivation, and they're not doing well. But I don't know if, if we should, can trust that those media reports. Yeah, I, I agree that completely with your skepticism or at least wariness about it. They're perfectly legitimate stories. There's no question that the, the Russians don't want to get into a, into wars. Uh, Crimea, of course, was taken over without the shot being fired, essentially. Um, so uh, if they start, uh, you know, if it starts going south, they're going to, there be problems, but they may not be able to do much about it, uh, given the suppression of the, of, of, uh, in, that, in that country. Uh, and I also don't know about the morale. Um, the, the idea here is that, you, and I think it's universal in pretty much in, in Russia, these are our brothers. They're, they're just like us. Um, and why, and, and uh, they're not, they don't look like the enemy. Uh, they did not feel that way toward Chechens, for example. And there's a lot of annihilation in, in, Chech, in Chechnya when they tried to secede from Russia itself. And there was not much love lost between, uh, there never has been between uh, Russians and Chechens. They, the Russians see the Chechens as a bunch of Bandits, essentially, crooks and stuff. Uh, but they don't feel that, certainly with the Ukrainians, quite the reverse. Uh, they're being fed a thing that, of course, it's all being run by a bunch of drug addicts and Nazis and stuff. But I don't, I don't know what, what's going to happen on that. It, it's, uh, it's clear that Putin is very much worried about that because he's now adopted this suppression thing in which if you refer to the war as, um, uh, as a war, <laughs> uh, you can be thrown in jail for 15 years. Um, and people are leaving, the journalists are being, you know, independent media is being closed down and so forth. Um, and uh, so uh, th- th- he wouldn't do that if he didn't think he, one, one of his weak areas would be sort of rebellions uh, from, uh, from Russian people. They have protested big time on various things like changing the rules about um, uh, when you can start collecting your pensions and so forth. And he, and he buckled on that so a few years ago, very sensibly from a political standpoint, at least, not necessarily an economic one. Uh, so he knows that the possibility is there. Um, but, um, I, you know, it's going to be miserable, I think, for, for Russia. Even if this thing sort of ends, they have a settlement, that, that kind of saying. And there's also, I should be saying, I should say, there are people who I generally respect who think he has ambitions to reconstitute the Soviet Union or that he wants to take over all of Ukraine and incorporate it into Russia. And I think that's not true, uh, judging from what he said. And, but possibly they're right. We'll have to see on that. Um, and, of course, it, it's possible that he will. Um, he may not think he'll do that now, but five, years, five months from now or something, he might. Who knows? Uh, but it, uh, well, or on the other hand, that, that, maybe, that quote. That, that quote from Putin, I don't know what, to what extent it was taken out of context, but that, you know, the loss of Ukraine or the breakdown of the Soviet Union in, in 1990s, the worst thing that ever happened in Russian history, and we have to remedy that. Mm. So it seems logical to assume, well, by that he means we're going to cobble together something like a, a USSR and, and call it Russia. Yeah, there is. There, it, well, his most famous statement on that is anybody that doesn't feel nostalgia for Russia, for, for the Soviet Union, doesn't have a heart. Anyone who thinks we can put the Soviet Union back together doesn't have a brain. Uh, that's probably his most famous <laughs> thing. And then what happens is that second statement never gets stated in the West. Um, and so the, the, at one point he did, it was saying that. Again, it, just last summer, he was saying in print, the only ideal thing would be basically free independent, essentially, uh, in Ukraine. They'd be like Austria versus Ger- Germany. People go back and forth across the border. They're already doing it. You know, there are Russians working in Ukraine that were before, and vice versa. Yeah, just as there are Austrians working in Germany and Germans working in Austria. Uh, so you'd have the inter- you know, and there's, break- there's families on both people on both sides of the, whether they're Ukrainian or Russian uh, speaking. So um, that's what that's. He was. He said that. Why not? Why not emphasize that? Uh, maybe he was lying. Maybe he's got more these uh, higher ambitions, but I don't see a lot of evidence for it. 
Right. So he probably wouldn't go after the Baltic states because they are part of NATO. So that and that was part of the USSR. So that's probably not his ambitions. He can't do that. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Uh, essentially, Ukraine is very special. Uh, and it was in, in, 90, in 2014 uh, with the uh, taking over Crimea and everything. Uh, they, 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 uh, it's part of the heritage. And, and the Russians, you know, see that as part of their, their history going back a hundred going back hundreds of years. Um, and it's also the uh, home of the Black Sea Fleet. And one of the things that really set them going, I think, at that time was that if Crimea, if this new government came in, uh, it might uh, uh, cut the um, uh, lease that Russia has on, uh, on the base in Crimea, uh, the Sevastopol uh, NATO base, and therefore cut out the Black Sea Fleet. I'm not clear he needs a Black Sea Fleet, but, fleet, but anyway. Uh, that was it, it, it's, it's special in that case. Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia don't have any of those real connections. Remember, by the way, in, 19, in t- 2014, there are a lot of people saying, okay, that's his first step. He's not going to go after the Baltic states because they have a large uh, Russian minority, for example. And that did not happen. He also did not recognize, he still has not recognized, um, uh, or taken in at any rate, uh, the, uh, the Donbass uh, uh, group area, which is, which is a secessionist group in, in the east of Ukraine. He, he supported them, and now he's recognized them as independent states, but not as part of Russia. And they've been moving gradually in the Russian direction, just from an economic standpoint, because they've been uh, cut off from the rest, of, in many cases, cut off from the rest of Ukraine. And it is also a poor Russian area in general. Right. So those two independent groups, the People's Republics, as they're called, um, I guess that brings up the question is, well, well what constitutes a, a nation? You know, who decides? Is it the language, you know, what they look like, the culture, the food, you know, the, the, the tradition, the history, the connection to the people in other countries? You know, why, you know, why not recognize them if that's what they want? But maybe that's also not good information because we're getting that from Putin. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, the idea of the United Nations and of the League of Nations was that in order to deal with international war, which always seemed to be about territory, at least uh, in the first instance, though frequently other things besides uh, other causes, what we should do is divide up the whole world into a bunch of countries, states, big nations, um, which would basically be nation states insofar as you could do that. Um, and then we would say, okay, these are the borders, you can't change them except peacefully. Um, and um, that didn't work too well with Hitler and didn't work too well with Mussolini, didn't work too well with the Japanese. But after World War II, uh, it was reinstituted, of course, in the United Nations. And for the most part, it's been pretty impressive. The only case before this in which one United Nations country tried to take over another United Nations country was when Saddam Hussein's Iraq took over Kuwait. With a similar argument, by the way, he was saying that Kuwait was an unnatural state because it used to be part of Iraq and it was the British the British colonizers who'd cut it off and so forth. Uh, And that was bent with universal, like this thing, uh, universal uh, uh, rejection, including both the Soviet Union under Gorbachev at the time and, of course, the the Americans. And eventually, of course, he was pushed out in the Gulf War of 1991. Um, And and so we're seeing a replay of that. And the other case where this has happened is is happening now. Uh, And it seems to be potentially negotiable. I can't guarantee that by any means. It's going to be increasingly miserable for the Russians, I think, just to, to deal with it. Uh, if, if if the stories about the Russian troops not wanting to kill brothers, Ukrainians, are true, uh, and there have been quite a few of those stories, um, that w- would suggest that things are uh, really very difficult, and uh, even at this state, and even if they do re- quash the resistance, uh, uh, there there's still urban warfare to worry, be worried about. Um, you know, there's there, 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 women and children of it left. There's a bunch of men with guns who know the territory extremely well. Uh, eventually, we'll even learn how to run, fire the weapons they've been given. Uh, and uh, it could go on for a long time. It could make, be like Afghanistan or, or Iraq uh, for the United States. Right. Just drag on for years and, and decades even, because how do you take over a country if the people don't go along with it? Right. You know, there's 44 million Ukrainians. All right, so say 4 million are 
are gone and four more million are too young or whatever. But anyway, you have tens of millions of people and a couple hundred thousand troops you'd have to send in. Well, the way the Nazis did it, they just went door to door and just shot everybody that didn't go along with it. Right. So, I mean, that, but what's the end game there? You know, you're never, the, those people will never want to be part of Russia once you go down that path. And, and, and has he gone too far down a path now where he can't back out and say, okay, I'm going to pull my troops out because we're not going to at this point say, okay, we promise Ukraine will never join NATO or for 25 years or whatever. That seems unlikely at this point because the troops are there. So now what? Yeah, well, it, it, I don't know. Um, uh, what it seems to me is there's still a possibility that that would work. In other words, you could have a, a settlement. I mean, he hasn't really taken over the country, of course. Uh, he hasn't even taken over major cities yet. Um, and each one is going to be painful. Um, and uh, and uh, with, uh, on both sides. Uh, and he could say, okay, we'll withdraw the troops. Uh, we'll, this will all be over. We want this. But we want this uh, agreement, which is the only reason. The only, he has not said, uh, I'm fighting to take over Ukraine. I don't think he's ever said that. He's just sort of implied it maybe in some cases. But his specific demands have been Ukraine cannot become a member of NATO because that, we see that as a threat. Uh, and we don't want to be overly militarized. And of course, he's worried about these uh, semi-fictitious uh, 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 Nazis as well. There's a, a, a lot so, of people are worried. A lot of people, let me just insert, a lot of people are worried about his mental stability. Uh, William Gates, uh, uh, Robert Gates, was on uh, Zakaria on a uh, show last Sunday. And the clip is on, on uh, of his talk, his, uh, his interview is on, on, uh, on, uh, is, is on the web. Um, and he's saying the same thing. Said, you know, and, and also Macron said that. Uh, I, you know, I talked to him and he seemed to be a reasonable, practical, down-to-earth type guy and very careful. When he, he did take risks, but when he did so, they were carefully calculated. And I don't see that that much anymore. And that is really uh, potentially dangerous. Uh, a possibility, of course, would be for a coup uh, within, within the uh, leadership, but he's probably pretty good at uh, keeping him out to isolate, uh, going. <laughs> he's also been isolated for the last couple of years because of COVID. And one of the things that's really remarkable about this is the guys there don't seem to understand Ukraine. I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of people, you know, about Ukraine, and, and you know, they say he don't know, they don't know what's going on in Ukraine. They think they do, and they make up this story about the neo Nazis and so forth, and not to mention drug addicts and terrorists. Um, but they don't they don't understand what it is, what it is there. There's a lot of things to understand, um, and and you'd think the Russians uh, would be would be able to do so, but they, they simply haven't. The Russian leadership. Another one of these stories I'm skeptical of is the you know the bounty million dollar bounty put on Putin's head by one of the oligarchs. But it turns out he's some entrepreneur that lives in San Francisco. And it's <laughs> like okay, you know how's he gonna how's he gonna make that happen? That sounds like one of these these BS stories. I assume Putin must be just totally isolated, protected, sheltered. There's just no chance you're gonna send in. Rambo and the and the Navy SEALs to take him out. That's and we we can't do that anyway, right? That's illegal. You cannot legally assassinate a foreign leader, right? Yeah, no, I was thinking about a, a rebellion within the, the top ranks of the military or something yeah. like that within you know, within Russia. It has to be an I, I, and, and I, Yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, they tried to kill Hitler, right? Uh, and we failed at that many times. Yeah, right. And uh, there was a real yeah. and it's so. Yeah, I read, read a book once about Hitler's um, security, and uh, it wasn't all that complicated. You know, he, he didn't know where he was at any one time, and people were, and they, obviously during the war, everybody's trying, everybody, everybody's trying to kill him. Uh, everybody's trying to kill him, and um, it, it was not all that difficult to keep um, out of the way. Also, Saddam Hussein, you know, you'd have people running around that looked like him that weren't him, and uh, he he had a schedule a meeting and not show up. And then there'd be, there'd, be, there'd be several scheduled meetings, and one of them he'd actually show up at, that kind of thing. So no one knew exactly where he was at any one time. That's not a real way to live a yeah. life, but Putin might be, uh, be able to do that. And he does seem to have a very elaborate and uh, uh, dedicated uh, security team around him, as far as I know. Yes, I would imagine. As an ex-KGB officer, I assume he knows every <laughs> trick in the book. Right. Uh, and he knows how to kill people with radiation. <laughs> 
right. poisoning. All right, so uh, let's talk about the nuclear ra- rattling, the nuclear uh, weapons uh, sword in the in the field there. Uh, I wrote about this, and then I got an email this morning from somebody who responded to this. It, basically, I was saying, you know, oh, here we go again, the threat of nuclear war. So this guy writes to me, uh, let me see, his name is Bill Lawrenson, who's a colleague and a longtime reader. He says, as a former Air Force officer and graduate of the Air Force Academy, as someone who has studied the Russian language for years, and as someone who has listened to Putin for many hours, I was curious about his reported statement that he was putting his nuclear forces on high alert. Putin seems like a long-term strategic thinker, and it didn't seem in character for him to be making such a rash statement. So I watched a YouTube video of him making this alleged statement. Nowhere in the statement does he mention the word nuclear. None of the simultaneous translators mention the word nuclear. What he says in Russian, and then he, uh, I'll post this in the show notes, uh, and this can be, and then he translates it. So here's Putin. Therefore, the orders of the Minister of Defense and the Chief of the General Staff to transfer the deterrence force of the Russian army into a special mode of combat duty, close quote. And this guy continues, Russian nuclear forces are not part of the Army, Navy, or Air Force of Russia. They are a separate branch, which is called the Strategic Rocket Forces of the Russian Federation. Then he gives the Russian uh, words there for that. If he had wanted to put his nuclear forces on high alert, as has been stated or implied in almost all Western media, he probably would have referred to this particular branch. The only partially correct headline that I saw out of hundreds was one small news article from CNN, quote, Putin orders deterrence forces, which includes nuclear arms, to be on uh, high alert. However, CNN also had this video headline, Putin orders nuclear forces on high alert. (laughs) So... Maybe that's an example of one of this misinformation and mistranslation. And yeah, misinterpretation. Well, that shouldn't be. That's really good sleuthing work there uh, on that. Um, one, one, one issue we might talk about in, in my book, The Stupidity of War, I talk about how there hasn't been an international war for a long time. Uh, and uh, 77 years in Europe, of course, that one of the great achievements of human uh, uh, endeavor, it seems to me. Um, and this obviously... It does not fit the thesis of the book terribly well, um, but what I th- and so one of the questions is: Is this the end of it? In other words, are, is this going to cause other countries to want to d- commit the same kind of aggression? And it just, it just seems to me no. Uh, this seems to be a, a bizarre sort of fluke kind of thing. You don't see people lining up saying, "Now I can get back at my neighbor," you know, by attacking and so forth. Uh, and also the extraordinary, uh, even if it's only moral, uh, support for, for uh, 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 outrage at the, uh, at, the, uh, 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 at the invasion is really impressive. Uh, the, the sanctions, you know, everybody's being sanctioned, including opera singers, you know, uh, and uh, everybody getting on the bandwagon. It may, may, may not have much of a, it may not have a practical thing, though I, I really think Gergiev, the conductor, and should be, I think he's a genius as a conductor, so... It's our loss if he, if he can't come over here, at least from a musical standpoint. Um, but anyway, the, 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 this, this worldwide reaction, uh, which goes way beyond what the sanctions are doing, is really impressive. Uh, it's really totally condemned. The only thing I can find similar, was when it, which is parallel, obviously, was when Saddam Hussein took over Kuwait. There was, you know, except for the Palestinians, <laughs> I think nobody uh, supported Saddam in that case. It was totally... So it's not like a bunch of people saying, "Okay, this is liberates us from our uh, uh, from our uh, uh, lack of going into international wars." I think it basically is just uh, in, uh, a separate sort of incident. I think it's a refutation of your thesis and the stupidity of war any more than it is for Steve Pinker's "The Better Angels of Our Nature," who, by the way, told me the other day that uh, the Ukrainian edition of the better angels of our nature was supposed to come out last week. <laughs> it's like, oh, bad timing. <laughs> right. But the thesis is not that there'll never be war again or there'll never be a single uh, counterexample. It's a it's a propensity or it's a probability uh, argument that you know the probabilities go up or down depending on the different dials that you're tuning of you know international trade, membership in international organizations, the score your polity score on on the kind of democracies that are. Uh, in the equation and, you know, and, and on and on and on. So um, I, I just, it, this is 
possibly a blip, hopefully. Uh, although I heard uh, Neil Ferguson the other day call this the first shot of Cold War II. This is mm-hmm. it. We are now in Cold War II. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. And I, I, I was corresponding a bit with Pinker on that thing. And he does have an article on it in, uh, in the Boston Globe um, probably two days ago or so. And basically making the points that you, you just made and Ferguson does not make. Yeah, I don't understand what it means to be a new Cold War. The Cold War was about ideology and the Soviet Union's and international communism's effort to expand. It was not a military thing so much. Uh, as uh, 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 a support for uh, uh, revolutionary civil wars and, of course, for class warfare, which is built into the ideology going back to Marx, certainly amplified then by Lenin. Uh, and that, that died out, and so did the Cold War, uh, with, with, uh, when, when Gorbachev essentially abandoned that, that class warfare uh, idea. Um, and I don't think anything like that. There's no ideological thing, including the threat from China. Uh, China want they, they, people say, "Hey, look, we have to compete." Uh, that's not the same as we have to fight, um, and they don't. They, and they don't have any territorial ambitions except, obviously, the issue with Taiwan, which goes back seventy-five years. Um, so um, it just doesn't seem to me it's it's really more like the same. It's certainly not subversive in the sense that they're trying to make everybody look just like Russia or just like China. If so, they're not doing a very good job of it. What could it escalate to? Would would this be like a green light for China to 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 make a move on Taiwan or or other states to do something similar? Yeah, I don't think any other states. But the the, the issue about uh, if I were Chinese, um, there the, the the resistance I must say so far within Ukraine has been quite really quite remarkable. I didn't expect all that much difficulty of taking over. My concern, my for for why it seemed a dumb idea was not so much the invasion would would fail, uh, but the, the occupation would fail, and that's that's yet that's yet to come by, by and large. Uh, if I were Chinese, uh, one of the possibilities that I'm sure they talk about is if we, we, we if we invade Taiwan, uh, they'll welcome us with open arms and throw flowers at our you know at our feet and so forth, and they'll be so happy to be back in China, and they can visit their you know Chinese birthplaces on the on the mainland anytime and so forth and so forth. Um, and uh, I think the resistance shown in Ukraine uh, would certainly give pause to anybody that thinks it's going to be a walkover. Might, it might be that they just walk in and, China, and the Chinese in, in Taiwan would say, okay, we're not going to fight, it's, it's hopeless. Uh, the Ukrainians are uh, showing that uh, they can, even ill-trained um, and, uh, and poorly, and not, obviously massively outnumbered, uh, can make, uh, make it... Very difficult for even a major invading force. Um, so, if I, if I, I think the Chinese lesson from this might well be, uh, that's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it for China, of course, is to develop into an open and friendly, warm society, and Taiwan might join up on its own accord. Now, there is the affinity with China, with a certain amount of autonomy, perhaps, uh, but that's certainly not the direction that China is going in now. So how do we nudge Putin into doing something less aggressive with, so that he can also save face? Because at this point, you know, a, a guy that, that, that makes that move uh, is, is, he can't just turn around and say, never mind, I, I changed my mind. I, that was a bad idea. I mean, no one ever does that, right? So, uh, you know, how do you nudge him to, you know, stop the fighting and let's sit down and talk and, okay, let's make some concessions? Because... Biden's not going to say, "Okay, we give up." You can, uh, we promise, Ukraine will never be part of NATO. That's never going to happen either. Now at this point, right. so where well, do you see I, it going from here? I, I think, and in, in, in what he can say is, uh, "What I wanted to do is keep NATO, uh, Ukraine out of NATO." Uh, unfortunately, we had to actually invade to do that, but we finally got an agreement on that. So if he does get that agreement, even if it, and I said it forever, but in twenty-five years, you know, it'll be ninety-five. <laughs> Uh, and uh, everybody else who's 70 will also be 95 by that time. Um, and, uh, you know, then that's a long, that's a quarter of a century. And I think we can coast for that time. And if some, something comes up after that, we'll have to figure that one out. So I think he can say, okay, um, I, got, I got a deal. Uh, you know, Khrushchev uh, appeased John Kennedy at the, at the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy said, I'm really angry because you're putting those missiles in there. And Khrushchev said, um, okay, I'll take him out. And uh, Kennedy said, cool, 
and and, uh, uh, and he never invaded. He did give a non-invasion pledge, and there's some other things, obviously, about uh, Sub Rosa and changes of missiles in, in Turkey and so forth. But anyway, he could basically say, I won that one. You know, before that, we were worried about he was going to attack Cuba, and now we don't have to worry about that nearly as much. And I think, I think Putin could say the same thing. Um, and the big thing was, and, and it's consensual pretty much, I think, uh, within, within Russia, as I've indicated, um, that um, we will be, um, uh, that, that uh, the, 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 the red line is with Ukraine uh, becoming a member of NATO. And that's been a, a security event, uh, and, and we've solved that problem, uh, at least for 25 years or whatever it is. Or if we get this big settlement, like with the Austria thing, that will really, that'll, that'll be a permanent thing potentially. Um, so from his standpoint, it was, okay, we had to do a lot of rocket rattling and so forth to get these guys to the, the bargaining table. Um, but we've got this deal where Ukraine, though still a separate independent country in, in any formal sense, uh, nonetheless will never join NATO. It's going to be neutral. Uh, by the way, uh, there's been some indications that the, uh, the Ukrainians have been talking since January with the Russians about the possibility of, uh, of neutralization. So it's not a new idea. But I, th I think he can sell that. And I, um, that, um, and, uh, too bad we had to go to a war. Too bad we had to get some people killed. Uh, it was pretty ugly there for a while. Uh, but they, uh, I, I was sort of forced into it, you know, all those damn neo-Nazis and stuff like that. Um, and uh, <laughs> we, and then we've now right. got, we got uh, 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 Ukraine where we need it. Uh, it's not going to be a threat. Uh, maybe everybody would prefer that it would join, you, uh, join the Soviet, the Russia, like Ukraine did, but we didn't get that. But that was not part of the original demand, and it never has been an explicit thing. I want to take over Ukraine. Uh, the assumption is that he wants to have some sort of sphere of influence thing there. And uh, to a degree, you know, that's sort of vaporous international relations talk as far as I'm concerned. Um, and and, uh, and uh, he, uh, Ukraine would... And has, I think, paid attention to uh, so Russian security demands, and I think they probably will in the future as well. Um, it seems to me it's a win-win situation. Uh, you, and I think Biden couldn't, we'll have to, and maybe Biden couldn't sell it, I don't know. But it seems to me uh, to, to simply say, look, we weren't going to let those bloody people into NATO for 25 years anyway. He hasn't said that, but he could say that. And these are the reasons the ones I've already given you. Um, and uh, so all we're doing is formalizing reality. We don't want them in. The Germans and the French and others are, don't want them in probably forever. Um, but um, uh, so we cut a deal. Uh, we, we, we caused him to pull back his invasion of Ukraine. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a rough thing. Uh, Russia is going to be in big trouble for the next 10, 20 years because of the, its actions, because people won't trust it. Foreign firms won't invest. People won't buy their vodka, much less their oil, uh, gas, or they'd be wary about it. They're looking for alternative energy sources. It turns out we've got them, namely liquid, liquefied natural gas. Um, and uh, they're already moving in that direction. It's a little bit too expensive now. But if, you, if your gas goes up and you get it from a reliable source, that's probably better than paying a little bit less and getting it from an unreliable source. And I think that's the lesson that Europeans, it, it, Europeans are drawing from this. That's really bad long term. Even Putin leaves office and stuff like that. Um, Russia, Russia basically is is not looking good economically since 2014. They grew from uh, the 1990s through to, 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 to 2014, but they've been basically pretty much stagnated economically since that time. And I don't think things look very good for its future. People even before this war, in fact, before this whole crisis and everything, economists looking at it. Um, there's a book by Tim Fry, for example, called Weak Strong Men. And the general consensus among economists was that without this crisis, before the crisis, without even thinking about COVID, um, the next 10 years did not look very good, did not look very good for Russia economically. And I think that's going to be exacerbated substantially no matter how this crisis comes out. What is their ranking in like per capita GDP or whatever measures you want to use economically in the world? Um, I'm not sure what Russia is. Uh, it, uh, China's 
China's about 49, and I think Russia's like 37 or something like that. Um, mm. uh, uh, Tim Fry has in his so book. So if they didn't have nuclear weapons, if they didn't have nuclear weapons, would they be considered a, a superpower and somebody we need to be concerned about? I don't think so, substantially. I mean, the, the common thing is they're a gas station with, with uh, nukes. Um, and there's a really interesting article by a, guy, a former student of mine named Stephen Kotkin uh, in Foreign Affairs about five years ago. Um, in which he says, this is a pattern for Russia for the last 500 years. They've constantly tried to act like number one, and they don't have the wherewithal to do it. Now they represent about 1.5% of the global GDP. They can't possibly do much of that, you know, with that. With that. In fact, they've always been punching above their weight, including during the Cold War in many respects. Um, so I think that's... Uh, it, 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 what, it, what he points out is they've never been willing to accept sort of second-class status. They still have this idea about there being a, you know, big, and of course they do take up a lot of space on the map. No question about that. But other countries, like Sweden, used to be a great power and then went into sort of something else, uh, which is perfectly happy with, and staying out of wars for an extremely long time. Uh, Germany, France, Britain. Uh, and uh, the, Russia hasn't accepted that yet. Uh, and they've been trying to punch above their weight, and their weight is not very great, uh, outside of the fact that they have nukes, none of which they've been able to do much with, uh, even to scare people, pretty much. Yes, it's, they're just deterrents. They, can't, they cannot be used. I mean, they just can't be used. <laughs> and though, although they see in the news this morning that uh, Japan reported that North Korea fired another missile into the, into the sea there, and... You know, again, that's his fourth in four weeks or whatever. I guess he's probably testing the waters to see if, uh, you know, he can rattle things like like Putin is uh, during this time. Yeah, that, that's a, it. Looks like Russia sometimes called a, a big North Korea. Uh, the only time anyone pays attention to it is when it rattles its rockets. Um, and um, and uh, I think North Korea is basically not a threat to anybody. They they were they're, they're responding to threats that they saw coming, particularly out of the George W. Bush. Um, White House when he said he's going to, after 9-11, we're going to eradicate evil in the world. And the three countries that are the source of evil are North Korea, Iraq, and Iran. And when he geared up to attack Iraq, that's when they went out of the, out of the uh, non-proliferation treaty and built their bomb. Uh, I don't think it's, it, it, they're not going to give it up. I, don't, I think we, you know, there's various things we should be doing in, in Korea. Uh, but uh, I don't think they, they pose a threat. And then they're trying to deter Something that's not going to happen, and I think uh, I think the same thing pretty much with the other nuclear deterrents, um, including during the Cold War, as far as I'm concerned. My book deals with that issue. Yeah, so this would be an example of outcasting in the form of economic sanctions not working with North Korea, in this case, uh, and maybe only barely with Iran. Um, you know, so if you take their perspective. If you have nukes, then America will leave you alone. They won't invade you, yeah. and uh, you know they won't hassle you too much. And you get to have a table, you chair at the table with the big boys. Some, sometimes, uh, yeah, it's it, some, something like that. It does. It's not clear that uh, North Korea does. I mean, North Korea and, and, and Russia are the same in the sense they really want more attention paid to them, and they don't get it very much. And the fact that essentially Putin has been dissed all these years uh, by the United States uh, is appropriate in the sense that they aren't very important. Um, that I think obviously that was a mistake because they obviously have security concerns and can do something about it, hence this uh, ridiculous, uh, stupid war. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's not much of a threat, it seems to me, overall. Um, except they still have the capacity of do, doing boneheaded things like this attack in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. Let's talk about American foreign policy. We have our critics. Uh, I was just reading yesterday, Noam Chomsky denouncing Putin and the invasion, but then adding, of course, as he's wont to do, uh, this is really no different than what the United States did when they invaded Iraq, the moral equivalency argument, you know, uh, you know, they're bad, we're bad, uh, you know, we need to, to, to move the criticisms around fairly around the globe. And, uh, you know, how do you respond to, to those kind of questions? Yeah, well, to agree, I, I agree. The, 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 the thing that bothers me currently is about the rules-based world order. I'd like to know what was the rule that was the basis for attacking um, Iran, Iraq, maybe also for Afghanistan. 
Uh, and the Russians do bring that up, and it's perfectly appropriate. Those are two disastrous wars caused by the United States in massive, massive, massive re overreaction to what happened in, in 9-11. And they just did it. And uh, they were naked acts of aggression by then. And so they can say, okay, you do it. Why can't we do it? Um, so uh, what's the rule you're what's, what's the rule there? The rule is don't commit aggression. Well, you broke it. Well, I guess with Afghanistan, it would be because of 9-11. And that's where Osama bin Laden is and the terrorists, Al-Qaeda. Iraq, I don't know. I mean, it was the yellow cake, right? It was uh, Colin Powell going to the UN saying, we know that they have weapons of mass destruction. We had the yellow cake thing, and he had a few memos or whatever, and that and, you know, got the, the vote that he needed to justify the invasion through the UN. So I guess that would be the legal aspects of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. None of which was true, by the way. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't know if you even had much of, of leverage in that respect, obviously. The British and the French and the, and the Russians, uh, rather the, the, the French and the uh, Germans were constantly saying, this is a really bad idea, don't do it. And the, the argument in that case was, <coughs> in that case was, um, so suppose he gets weapons of mass destruction, so what? What's he going to do with them? He's surrounded by a coalition with, with thousands of them, and Israel has a lot more than he'll ever have nuclear weapons, uh, and so he can, he can sort of uh, you know, rattle his rockets, but he's not going to, yeah, he's going to dominate the Middle East because he's going to rattle the occasional nuclear weapon and then everybody will simply fall into line. Uh, well, we found in, in, the, in the Kuwait thing, when he took over Kuwait, and people, instead of saying, oh, how terrible and disgusting and wonderful this guy is, we better join his side instead throughout the Middle East, with the exception of the Palestinians, uh, everybody said, uh, no, this is not acceptable, and we'll join on coalition against you. So if he did try to dominate the Middle East with his pathetic little uh, atomic arsenal, um, I don't think it would be successful. So the argument, I don't think, I, I think the argument, even if the argument is with you, get weapons of mass destruction, but as I wrote at the time, actually, even if he gets these weapons, he's not going to be able to do what you say with them. He'll, he'll be like North Korea is now. He'll have a pariah state that happens to have nukes that people don't pay much attention to that they might continue to buy his oil. And is that the same problem with Iran? You know, we, we are forbidding them from getting nuclear weapons. Would you say, just let them have one? Who cares? We, you know, we can take care of that if they decided to do something crazy. Yeah, uh, I did a book, and it's also in the current book, about uh, uh, nuclear weapons, a difficult atomic obsession. Uh, since 1945, no one has been killed by a nuclear weapon. Since 1945, hundreds of thousands of people have died in an effort to keep nuclear proliferation from happening. There would be sanctions in various places in the course of the war in Iraq. Um, and so we ought to re really reevaluate that. Uh, North Korea has the weapons. Um, they're going to keep them. They, need them. they think they need them for their security. Uh, they may be completely wrong about that, but nonetheless, it's, it's not a negotiable kind of thing. Uh, and any more than the, the Crimean thing is you know, with Russia. And uh, we can live with it. Live with lots of nuclear weapons in a lot of places. If Iran gets them, um, I, it, it's, it's, uh, it's probably the same sort of thing. Um, they're, they're wasting their money overall. Um, so the urgency, I think, uh, should be kept in mind, uh, whether it's really valid. And... Uh, and, a, and then be some indication of the uh, of what the what the costs are. Uh, economic sanctions, as you mentioned before, don't have a very good record for changing policy. The current economic sanctions, by the way, are not so much trying to change his policy as to punish him. Uh, and economic sanctions are very pretty good at punishing people, hurting people, uh, but they're not very good at getting policy changes. Uh, just ask the Cubans. It's been 50 years, and they've had economic sanctions for all that time, and that it's not clear their policy has really been revolutionized because of the fact that the United States wasn't buying sugar anymore, um, so um, or it had a blockade or whatever. Um, so, so uh, and the 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 and economic sanctions can frequently kill large numbers of people, um, and they're the, usually the most innocent mm -hmm. of people. Right now, people are being killed by sanctions in North right, Korea. Right, not the leaders. Not the leaders, right. Uh, they, they, uh, in fact, they often profit from them because they can control smuggling, which becomes a very profitable enterprise then. 
um, but uh, we're, we're killing people with the economic sanctions currently, both in North Korea and I think in Iran overall. By the way, the Iran thing is interesting, that if we gave up this futile effort to try to, keep, uh, to, to deal with Iran, which hasn't been very successful, to say the least, um, they would uh, re-enter the oil market. Right now we need a lot more oil in the market because the price is so high. Um, and uh, so that would be a solution, a, a short-term, immediate, semi-solution at least to the problems that sanctions are causing the sanctioners. Uh, that I've heard one person actually bring that up, and I think it should be brought up more frequently. Right. What would happen if we just open up trade with Cuba, North Korea, Iran, Iraq, everybody? Just, you know, we'll, we'll open a chain of McDonald's there. We'll bring in Apple iPhones and, you know, just bring your, your people into the Western world. You can have your nukes, do whatever you want. But we're going to, and maybe in the long run, that would make them more Westernized, more peaceful and, and so forth. Yeah. I, what would be wrong with that? And, and nothing. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, it'd be very, it'd probably be very subversive in the case of Cuba, uh, you know, uh, as people yeah. get their, right, their phones and stuff like that, and they have a real problem. In the case of North Korea, um, Kim Jong-un has said specifically he wanted to do two things. One is secure the nation, which is why he got the nuclear program, because he had to deter the United States. And second, uh, adopt economic reform, uh, for, perhaps on the Chinese model, where, of course, the Communist Party remains in control, or even more relevantly might be Vietnam, where basically there's been a fair amount of economic reform, but of course the Communist Party is still in control. Uh, and it seems to me that latter thing should be fed. He's, he's done a few things um, to try to, uh, to uh, liberalize the economy. He hasn't gone very far, and he may never go very far. But it seems to me that what we should be doing is forgetting the nuke issue. Just if you put back burner at maybe 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years from now, revisit it, uh, but then concentrate on trying to make North Korea into a normal nation, at least as much as, say, Vietnam has. And so I think we ought to be working on that. And we're not, basically. <coughs> yeah. All right, John, let's just kind of do one last big picture look at, you know, going back centuries or even thousands of years. I mean, most of this tension we're experiencing is because there are nation states. What if there were only city-states? What do we need these borders for? What if the borders were porous, open to trade and travel, and everybody knew each other, and, and it was only city-states where the power was, so the mayor rather than the uh, dear leader, uh, dictator, president, prime minister, whatever, uh, you know, had all that power. And then, and then no one had too much power because there, there would be, I don't know, 10,000 little mini city-states or whatever. And, and uh, you know, could you could you foresee us ever, you know, getting to that point, maybe in 500 years or a thousand years? Because, you know, before, say, a thousand years ago, there there weren't, you know, just these huge, massive uh, nation states. Yeah, well, the, the idea with the League of Nations, the United Nations was, to, as I mentioned before, uh, divide the country into nation states and then say you can't change the borders. Uh, but within that, there's been a lot of erosion in the sense that sort of Barcelona is dealing with Scotland, you know, not going through Madrid or not going through London. Uh, but this, so that'd be sort of city-states. As long as you open up free trade, people look for it wherever it is. Uh, and I think that's been a process that's been, that's been developing and it develops where you don't have wars. Uh, and unfortunately, city-states are also, also pretty good at getting into wars with each other. You know, check out ancient Greece and so forth. So it's no guarantee that they mm, won't have wars. Good point. Uh, even at the small level. But I think that the basic system is working well. There's only been two cases in which one United Nations country has tried to take over another, as I pointed out. One is the Kuwait thing, and one is the, this current thing. And I think neither if, will prove to be harbingers of things to come. They're, they're freakish uh, exceptions overall, which I think uh, Steve Pinker would agree to, to as well. But, but basically, yeah. opening up trade is a really good idea, and there's been enormous progress in the last years, uh, in the last few decades, in uh, freeing up trade. It certainly hasn't gone as far as a lot of people would like, like Adam Smith and, and Ricardo, uh, but I think it's moving in that direction. Um, and, and what facilitates it is peace. I don't think peace is caused by these tr the trade, but the trade is facilitated by peace. You know, if we're not going to go to war, you know, the German and the French, Spent a lot of time really brilliantly getting into wars with each other. 
Uh, and uh, if they if they come to the conclusion that hey, we're not going to go into a war against each other, with each other, uh, maybe we ought to see if the other guy has something I want to buy, or maybe he'll buy my stuff. Uh, wine's going one way, beer the other, whatever. Uh, and uh, you know, so that's that's uh, it's not so much international trade causes peace, but I think peace uh, facilitates, not necessarily causes international uh, trade. You have to also believe in it. At one time, people didn't believe in it, and then Mercantilists and so forth, they basically wanted to be autarkic um, and uh, have everything inside. Um, and uh, so you have to also agree that the one, the, we want to get rich, and the best way to get rich is through trade, including international trade. Uh, over the last 200 years, I think well, that, that, that idea has run point in, Yeah, that was Adam Smith's point in debunking the mercantilist theory of economics, that you know it's a zero-sum game in that model where, you know, if, our nation gets rich, that means your nation has to get poor. So no one wants to, uh, you know, allow the other guy to get ahead. Well, that's not how economics works. <laughs> the, you know, you can be rich and we can be rich. And anyway, that's a d- different conversation. I feel sorry for um, the people that work in the, the field of, you know, sort of foreign affairs and what's the right policy. Because uh, I don't know, you know, it's like uh, Clinton didn't intervene in, in uh uh, Rwanda uh, early enough, and look what happened. You know, okay, and then he intervenes in Kosovo, and okay, that didn't go so well. And you know, and then the NPR interviewed some woman yesterday in Ukraine, just begging the United States, please come here. It's a genocide. They're killing us. Where are you? You guys are the world's police. You you proclaim yourself to be a moral nation, and you're going to help poor beleaguered people. Here we are. You want to protect civil rights? Here we are. Come help us. And it's like, well. <laughs> We just got out of two wars after 20 years, and, you know, we can't do everything. I, I really don't know what the right answer is. Well, it, 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 it's not clear that intervention works. I mean, the reason the United States didn't go into Rwanda is it previously had gone on a humanitarian mission into Somalia, um, in which it got involved in a civil war, and 21 Americans were killed in a firefight, and the United States, screw this, let's get out. Uh, and then, then the Rwanda happened, and basically the information was somewhat difficult to fathom, but obviously something really horrible was taking place. And and so the idea of getting in there uh, was not accepted. In many respects, as uh, some people have pointed out, uh, the genocide was so fast in Rwanda that the United States couldn't have gotten there in time anyway to do it, um, mm-hmm. to, 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 yeah. to deal with it. Uh, it's only 100 days and stuff. Um, and uh, so anyway, this, but anyway, the point is that intervening, uh, for example, the United States did intervene and a lot of other people did in the civil war in Syria. And all they did was basically um, extend the, the, the destruction. Um, the Civil War was worse than having Assad on top, which now, of course, has now happened again. Um, so inter- knowing how to do it, as the United States certainly learned both in Iraq and in Afghanistan, is not easy. Uh, and, uh, Afri- and, and, uh, and as the Soviet Union learned also in Afghanistan, um, it's not as if you can flip your you know, flip something and everything is, is peaceful. Sometimes you can come in and it works. Um, the United States did intervene in Panama um, and was able to put a democratic government in and, and uh, it's supposedly going to reduce the drug trade, but didn't have much impact on that, but at least it got rid of Noriega and it did also in Grenada. So sometimes you win, but in that case they had a country which was microscopic by comparison, uh, and, uh, but it sometimes can work. Um, there's also been other places where intervention has, uh, of, the, of various cases, has been in various states has uh, has worked. Military intervention, for example, in uh, Lebanon. I mean, in, in Liberia, uh, it was basically a civil war going on. International peacekeepers came in, mostly Nigerian, uh, and the war went away. Uh, the tyrant in charge uh, left, and they had an election, and they uh, and they voted in. Instead of a soccer star who was running for it, but they'd let a Harvard-educated female economist. Uh, and that was a big improvement. There's still plenty of problems, but it's certainly a hell of a lot better than that war was. So sometimes it does work, um, but as it's shown in Somalia, sometimes it can blow up in your face as well. And long term, as it has happened, obviously, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. I guess there's no formula you can run equation algorithm you just have to take them one at a time and make the best decisions you can about whether to intervene or not and then who knows yeah well one thing by the way that going back to the ukraine thing which follows from that um is the people who don't want to settle 
in Ukraine, which consists probably of like a foreign policy class in this country because we seem to be giving in uh, the kind of thing pro proposals I mentioned at the very beginning, um, are essentially saying we'd prefer to have this war go on rather than settle it. Um, in my opinion, they could possibly, I can't guarantee it'd be certain to work, but they can possibly settle it with a, uh, uh, the, this, either the moratorium thing or the neutralization thing, that, like the Austrian Peace, uh, Austrian peace Treaty. Uh, in other words, they can end this war, stop the occupation, and send the, send the Russians out. Uh, again, no guarantees that it'll work. You know, just because of an idea that a lot of pe the people have brought up that seems plausible doesn't mean it's going to click when you try to put it into motion. Uh, but if you're against that, it means you want to say, well, we don't want to give in on those two issues. We don't want to negotiate about them particularly. Instead, what we'd rather do is see if this war can get be longer and longer. And the people who suffer in it are going to be the Ukrainians, of course, as well as the Russian interveners. Um, so they, uh, uh, what they were saying, we, we want more war, more deaths, more chaos, more refugees, because we don't want to settle it, because we'll look like appeasers. If that's, if, uh, and my argument is that appeasement might well work in this case, and we ought to give it a, a try. If you're against that, it means we don't want to appease. We'd much rather let this war go on and get worse. Um, it might possibly appeasement won't work. Possibly Putin will say, no, 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 you got to, you know, I can't agree to any of that crap. Um, but it should be, really be tried, and I think there's a good chance it will work. Um, but uh, to reject that means basically you want to continue with the war, which is going to get complete. You how, know, do we increasing. Get your, how do we get your solution to the State Department? Do you know anybody you can call and say, <laughs> look, here's what you should do? Uh, and I've tried. <laughs> how does that work? I've tried. I have an op-ed on this. That I had, it never got to publish. I have to rework it now. Um, there are, there are, you know, the, the, the moratorium idea has been proposed in a couple of articles, in more than one, uh, at least by Thomas Graham, who used to be in the State Department, is now a professor, uh, and I'd strongly recommend that. And the, uh, the idea of, of imitating the Austrian Peace Treaty has been seriously discussed in, uh, at uh, 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 the, the Quincy Institute's uh, Anatole Levin, and also at, de at Defense Priorities by uh, um, uh, Steve Van Evera from MIT. Those, I strongly recommend that they're both monographs. They basically look into it. Um, and they also point out that if we did this, that opens the possibility of really settling everything in the area, including Bosnia, including Crimea, and everything else. Um, and they mean that may not help it happen. But starting with neutrality of... of, of Formal neutrality for Ukraine, the possibility of a wider settlement is also there. I think, I think that's true. Um, uh, negotiations can be difficult. Uh, and certainly the, the negotiations end up with the Austrian peace treaty were difficult. Uh, but it worked, um, as it is towering success overall. And Putin, has, as I mentioned, has explicitly said um, that that's the kind of arrangement he'd like to see, where... Crimea, I mean, where Ukraine is like Austria and, and Russia is like Germany. Two countries with the same tradition, same language, etc., etc., get along just fine with each other. But they're independent. You even use that word. Right. Yeah, it's interesting that the Western media has covered Putin saying, you know, I demand that Ukraine ne never be belong to NATO, but never the U.S. explanation for why that can't be allowed. I mean, we, what's our side on that? Well, you just explained all that for the last hour, 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, and, the, and the, yet... the, the, the Russians have pointed out what the United States says it's a sovereign right of a country to join any alliance it wants. Um, but there, the Russians point out, um, this, the other half has been left out, uh, at an agreement through the, uh, at the Organization for Cooperation and Security in Europe, uh, OSCE, um, in, I think, 2010, the United States signed on to something which said, A, any country has the, as any sovereign country can join any alliance it wants, as long as the alliance, of course, wants it. And then another thing, though, the next sentence says, however, in doing so, it has to take into concern the security concerns of the people of the countries next to it, which obviously be Russia. 
Um, and so it, it, uh, the, the, the Russians have brought that out on paper. The United States agreed to it in 2010 and also in another earlier agreement. Um, and uh, that seems perfectly appropriate. It is kind of messy. How do you figure that out? A country wants to join an alliance, but the other, his neighbor doesn't want it. Well, he, it says specifically that the uh, that they, there should be some consideration. It's required, in fact, for that decision to be based on this, con this concern about what might happen with, with other countries. Um, and um, the United States has not, re you know, has only said the first part. Uh, we can't take away Ukraine's ability to. Uh, decide what alliance to get into, they, and not the, the second. And they brought it up repeatedly, in print, in print uh, and it, it is not it is not gone any place. And I think they should do that. And uh, anyway, we'll have to see. It's a very fluid situation. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, John, I knew you'd you'd come up with a new perspective and and a clear, uh, rational analysis of this unfolding problem. We'll have you back in, in a couple months or a year from now to see how it all unfolds. That's pretty gutsy of you to say everything you said, given what how much we just don't know. Right. So uh, more to come, let's say. Okay, really, thanks. Thanks to be here. Really enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>